Hello everyone! Thanks so much for listening and watching this video. Thank you, Courtney, for the great introduction. And without further ado, let's get into the interview. What did past environments look like if they are constantly changing? Uh, that's, you know, uh, basically in geology and sedimentology and in other fields, we use uh, uh, rock record proxies or what I call, uh, you know, indicators it recorded in the in sedimentary rocks, particularly um, of past events. So, um, you know, as you're aware, you need to have an understanding of um, how, you know, events that are important in the geologic record are recorded in sediments, in sedimentary rocks. So you need to have an understanding of uh, the processes that operate on the, the, the surface of the earth that lead to particular facies or um, kind of bodies of uh, sediment. So it's that old saying, you know, in some ways the present is a key to the past. So I'd say a young uh, geologist, a student, um, needs to consider either in the field or, and preferably and, uh, through the literature, is how professionals interpret um, bodies of uh, sediment based on what is happening today at the Earth's surface. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't um, some sedimentary deposits that uh, may not reflect what's happening on the Earth today. Um, I think of, for example, snowball Earth, you know, the theory of massive glaciation. We don't have that on Earth today. It hasn't happened, you know, over hundred, hundreds of millions of years. But, you know, many of the same kind of um, uh, processes that are responsible for glaciation are recorded in the rocks that people like uh, uh, Paul Hoffman used to interpret the snowball earth theory. He was very, very, he, he did a lot of his work in South Africa and in Namibia, where they have these beautiful sedimentary rock sequences that record the change from uh, an interglacial world um, back in the Paleozoic or the Neoproterozoic, I think, um, into a full glacial world. And, uh, you know, geologists have wondered, for example, is, is it possible to have a repeat of a, you know, a set of conditions like that? And probably the answer is no, because the atmosphere is different now. And the distribution of continents on the surface of the planet is different. So we deal with a unique kind of um, period in geologic history where we would not get glaciation on that scale. But that isn't to say that you can't get glaciation on the scale of the ice ages, the Pleistocene glaciations, you know, where a third of the planet, of the terrestrial planet was covered by ice. To me, that's incredible, you know. And, uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm basically trained as a glacial geologist. So in British Columbia, we have a lot of sedimentary deposits um, that record these periods of glaciation, of continental glaciation. And um, coming back to your question, and I know I'm rambling, but I tend to do that, um, is, you know, we can see these deposits, these tills and these outwash deposits, and look at modern glaciers and modern landforms, um, geomorphic features, and make some reasonable um, interpretations of what's happened in the past. And that's a... Well, it's almost a four-dimensional exercise. You know, you need the three spatial dimensions, and then you need time. And in, in sedimentology and in geology in general, that's why time is so important, because it's an, as you mentioned, it's kind of an evolutionary thing. You know, things do change over time. And we don't look for, well, we look for snapshots in time, but we also want to see how those snapshots uh, kind of play out in terms of a video, you know, a time video. And it's every geologist's dream to transpose themselves back in time to see how this actually happened. But we make reasonable interpretations based on modern environments 
in modern landforms. And I would add, just as a final comment, that you know it's not just the the sedimentary rock record. Um, when you're dealing with young events in Earth history, um, and by young, I'll explain what I mean. Um, but when you're dealing with young events, you want to also interpret landforms because landforms are associated with sediment. So it's a two two component exercise. You want to understand what's beneath landforms. And again, returning to the issue of glacial geology, if we see a drumlin, you know, these nice kind of whale back ridges in the landscape, we can make a reasonable interpretation of what underlies them. You know, it's going to be a, probably a glacial deposit, maybe some outwash, but they're clues as to, they're part of the puzzle as to how you interpret the past. And then, um, you know, coming back to the issue of time, it's very important. I mean, a major field of uh, geology in general is, is um, geochronology. And traditionally, it's been based on the fossil record. So when you're dealing with old events, you use a fossil record. So you have biostratigraphy. Biostratigraphy is a relative age dating tool, um, but we have other ways of calibrating the biostratigraphic record using things like ash deposits that you can, I don't know if you're aware of this, but you can actually date volcanic ashes um, through the uh, radiometric techniques of uranium thorium and um, fission track. And so all this wonderful work has been done to kind of put numbers on the biostratigraphic record, put numbers on evolution. It's so cool. Perfect. Thank you very much. And I loved what you said. And this is exactly one of the reasons why I love geology in general is this overarching framework of all sorts of science topics yeah. and, uh, and even more, you know, like the factor of time also plays a huge role and it allows you to kind of play investigator with what happened in the past. But yeah. it's much more than just a game of knowing what happened uh, yeah. millions I, of years ago. I, I, actually look, is, I look at it as being a detective, you know, yeah. kind of, a detective without a crime, but you're, yes. you're trying to, yes. <laughs> it is detective work. And, uh, you know, geology, would, we would never be 100% sure of any interpretation. There's always uncertainty, but because a large number of scientists are working on problems, you tend to approach the truth over time. And that's true of all sciences. And it's how science works is you build upon what other people have done and you discard theories that, or you, you modify or discard theories that no longer can explain the data using tools that maybe those earlier researchers didn't have. Um, to kind of come closer to the truth. Oh, that's amazing. And as you said, it's not just a very beautiful science, it's also extremely useful. And as I'm sure your field, uh, studying natural hazards, most obviously demonstrates that uh, we need our sciences to be able to better prepare and yeah. uh, protect our communities. So could you say a couple of words why sedimentology specifically is useful and meaningful uh, to us as a global community? Absolutely. I'll just give you a couple of examples. Um, uh, okay. You know, for almost 50 years now, they've had a program called the Ocean Drilling Program, um, which basically recovers long records of sediments from the ocean basins. Um, and they've drilled in ocean basins all over the world. And I think of, uh, you know, the drilling that's been done off Antarctica, for example, you know, off the ice shelves in Antarctica. And they've actually uh, looked at um, how those sediments record changes in the uh, extent of the Antarctic ice sheet, particularly the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, over time. And uh, they've been able to date those records um, I'm not quite sure how, to be perfectly honest, but they, they're able to put uh, uh, time stamps on those records and record how the ice sheet has waxed and waned and how that relates to um, climate in the past. 
And this is incredibly important because one of the big players in the future in terms of climate response to or you know, how the earth responds to warming is what happens to our big ice sheets, the Greenland ice sheet and the uh, East and West Antarctic ice sheets. Um, and so better understanding what drives those ice sheets is incredibly important because then we may be able to say, well, under certain scenarios of future warming or you know, kind of a complex climate ocean systems, we can expect Antarctica, for example, to contribute more water to the oceans, which then will drive sea levels higher. And over what time frame? You know, how, how rapidly is that going to occur? We don't really know yet, but it's thought that the Antarctic ice sheet is a little buffered from what's happening to alpine glaciers, say in Europe, uh, smaller glaciers. But there are signs that the Antarctic ice sheet is responding to uh, current climate warming. So we need that information, that basic contextual information from the sedimentary record to forecast what might happen with a lot of uncertainties to uh, the ice sheets in the future. And one of my interests is sea level change. You know? So I'm really, I watch this literature very closely as to what's happening to understanding um, how Antarctica is responding to climate change. Because for example, in Vancouver, we have uh, a large area that's right at sea level and it's protected. It's like the Netherlands, it's protected from the sea by large engineered dikes. And, um, you know, 250,000 people live on this flat surface near sea level. So it's really important to know whether sea level is going to be, you know, 20 centimeters higher at the end of the century or a meter higher. It makes a big difference, not only to people living there, but to people who have to pay to increase the protective system. So you know, it kind of, it's stepping back from that concern to understanding how a big ice sheet responds to climate change. And, you know, it's not only the sedimentary record. They look at the ice cores that they've obtained from uh, Antarctica and Greenland to supplement that. But there's a big drilling program going off, off the, the Ross ice shelf and the Weedle ice shelf, Weddell ice shelf. Um, to try and understand how this ice sheet has responded to uh, what we know are significant climate changes in the ice. I was going to say that I read one of your papers in which you discuss a similar situation in which uh, the cause of um, uh, change in um, the rock record was an emptying of uh, glacial lakes. Uh, yeah. It was also yes. somewhere around Vancouver. And so I thought it, it was, you know, example number three or a very similar. Well, there you go. And that, yeah. that excited me because <clears throat> that was a detective project on my part, something that I had worked on for 10 years. And it was uh, driven by one finding 10 years ago. Um, and then I said, well, you know, I got to find out where these floods came from. So it, my search extended all the way up into central British Columbia over a distance of hundreds of kilometers. And it's still going on. That's what uh, is so cool, you know, because I want to kind of extend that work. Um, there still are unanswered questions. This is another element of geology is you'll find when you do a research project, you answer some questions and you open others, you know, and there's no end to it. <laughs> yes, thank you. That was very interesting. Thank you for sharing that. And I would want to go even further. Could you please, well, that's the next question on the list. Could you give some examples of your favorite um, maybe moments, discoveries, or research projects that became very memorable to you? Uh, geez, that's hard because I've, I've worked, you know, in so many different places. I've worked in... Uh, the European Alps. I've worked in, uh, done a lot of work in most of my work traditionally when I worked for the federal government was in Canada, of course. So it was in the Yukon and British Columbia. And I have fond memories of that because I was a younger professional and, you know, it was, I don't know, there's something about doing something when you're young. Um, 
And then I, I did, I had some students who worked in New Zealand and I really like that, you know, it's fantastic. Um, I suppose some of my best experiences have been in Patagonia. I've, I've done a lot of work in, in Argentina. Um, and the reason I like that and Bolivia and the reason I like, uh, high Altiplano terrain in Bolivia and, um, uh, and, um, Patagonian plains is the landforms uh, are spectacularly preserved. You know, the landscape tells you a story alone. Um, there are sedimentary deposits associated with that landscape that kind of help you with the story, but the landforms are just incredible. You know, um, there are uh, big east kind of uh, channels or valleys that are relic that date back to the Pliocene, even maybe the late Miocene, you know, that you sc still can see in the topography. If you go onto Google Earth, um, you can actually see these big abandoned channels of rivers that flowed off the, uh, the Andes when they were beginning to form and, and rise. And uh, the Andes, Southern Andes also supported an ice sheet. So that's part of my interest, uh, the Patagonian ice sheet. Um, which extended out onto the Patagonian plains in Argentina. And at its maximum, about a million years ago, actually reached the Atlantic coast. So it extended 200 kilometers away from the crest of the Andes across Argentina out into the Atlantic Ocean. Remarkable. You know, to me, it's crazy. And there are uh, beautiful um, kind of sediments, glacial deposits associated with those advances. Uh, because it's a very dry area, uh, you actually get some of the moraines that date back hundreds of thousands of years that are still preserved. And uh, the neat thing is that there is a volcanic belt on the Patagonian plains called the Paliaki uh, Volcanic Field that has been active from the Holocene, from post-glacial time, right back into the, the Pliocene. So you get these uh, volcanic deposits, these flows, that you can date, you can get numerical ages on them, uh, you know, through argon-argon dating or potassium-argon dating, and then relate them to the glacial. Some of the volcanic eruptions are younger than glacial deposits, some of them are older. So you can piece together a story on the chronology of uh, glacier advances. And it's pretty academic, I have to say, but it's just, oh my God, you know, I'm, Earlier in my career, I was so used to working in forests. Forests are great. I love forests, but they hide all the evidence, you know. In British Columbia, we've got uh, boreal forests that, um, you know, just basically cover all the landforms. And until we had LIDAR, that was a challenge. In Patagonia, it's grasslands, you know. It's total non-treed. And you can see these landforms with amazing clarity. And uh, so I've enjoyed that very much. I've worked with Argen my Argentine colleagues. We have a group that have about 10 Argentines that we work with. And uh, it's socially, culturally, geologically, it's a spectacular experience that um, I have to say is one of the highlights. <laughs> Sounds amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and kind of the short answer to your question is I have to say that South America is one of the highlights, but... I have never been disappointed in anywhere I've worked. It's, they're all challenging and interesting. And um, I've had an experience to work in a lot of different places. And again, it's why I feel so, so fortunate, so blessed to, you know, have pursued this career in geology. Yes, geology is beautiful. So I totally agree with you. That was a, a wonderful answer. And uh, maybe um, how about some, remarks uh, as to the pro the educational process like what could make sedimentology more approachable to people what could um what do you think could be made to improve the way sedimentology is taught and communicated uh, you know once you're a geologist you can just say well this is interesting this is a detective story but if you're talking to a person who's not a geologist you have to explain why why sedimentology is important. 
And um, we've talked a little bit about that. You know, and you can give examples of uh, the importance of sedimentology. And I haven't touched on, you know, the whole resource issue, you know, that sedimentology is intimately linked to uh, finding hydrocarbons. Um, and in fact, yeah, you know, kind of people might want to know why, uh, why there's oil in the oil sands, you know, and that's inherently interesting to people. We've got this massive resource in Northern Alberta and uh, the sands are, you know, old sands, but they're not lithified. They're not really, they're poorly lithified. So there's a lot of pore space in, in the sands and it's, become a reservoir for hydrocarbons at shallow depths in the crust. And I think people really interested in, that, you know, and that's an example where you can explain to them why sedimentology is important. You know, and sedimentology is, can be explained in that context as being practical. It linked to um, important earth issues today because young people want to be part of solutions. They don't want to be part of problems. And, um, I always think that geology is, is fundamental to solving societal problems um, in whatever, you know, direction you take it. And so I think that's important. And um, I also think that uh, stories are important, telling stories. People like stories more than they like facts. So if you can build a story around it, and here's an example of a story. Okay, I'm going to give you an example of a geological story. Um, when we were working on uh, great earthquakes on the West Coast, um, we recognized that there had been one of these fairly recent, you know, in the past many hundreds of years, uh, one of these magnitude nine earthquakes that caused the crust to subside over a thousand kilometer distance. And we also knew that First Nations people um, carried that information and, and traditions that they passed on orally from generation to generation. Um, so the question arose as to, well, okay, when did that happen? It's important to know when it happened. How close are we to the next one? And so geologists use radiocarbon data. You know, they basically dated fossils right at that contact between the top of the peak and the underlying tsunami sand. And they said, wow, it is young. You know, it's only a few hundred years old. Okay, can we do better than that? So then they found some big standing snags in tidal marshes, trees, big uh, Sitka spruce and uh, hemlocks that uh, had actually stayed rooted, but had dropped down at the edges of the marsh marshes and had died when the salt water kind of got into their roots and killed the trees, but they were still standing. They no longer had bark. They were just kind of ghostly trees. And so they were able to use a technique called dendrochronology, which is tree ring dating. Um, you look at the pattern of rings in trees and you relate them to the pattern of rings in living trees. And they were able to say, well, we can do better. You know, radiocarbon dating only tells us, gives us information over about a 20 year period around 1700 AD. And the dendrochronology, unfortunately, the bark was not present. We didn't know exactly what ring we were dating, but the outermost ring in the trees was sometime around 1698 to 1702, so 320-ish years ago. And then, you know, some Japanese researchers put us all to shame because we had brought this down to a four-year period, and they said, well, if this earthquake occurred then, it would have produced a huge tsunami, just like the tsunami in the Indian Ocean. And maybe there's some written evidence of it in the Japanese uh, literature. And so they went into the Japanese literature and they found a story of a massive, what they call an orphan tsunami. It was a tsunami that was not accompanied by any local ground shaking, which was totally freaky to the Japanese because they associate tsunamis with local earthquakes, you know, strong shaking, they run for the hills. But this one just came in out of the blue. And it turned out that was the earthquake, uh, that earthquake was on the other side of the ocean. And the tsunami had run across the ocean and actually run up about four or five meters in Japan and caused a lot of damage. 
And so they not only told us it happened in 1700, they told us it happened on January 26th in 1700. Wow. <laughs> and I That's love to tell that story because people say, wow, that tells me something about how scientists work. <laughs> And how small the world is. One thing about the interesting about reconstructing Earth that makes it even more complex, and BC, British Columbia is an example of this, is that a lot of their rocks and um, mountain formations actually came from other places of the Earth. So they aren't originally there. So the island arcs have actually collided into the continent, which creates these different complexities to even the story of if you're just starting in one spot, if you don't recognize that, I mean, your whole history that you're creating could be totally different if you don't recognize that, oh, this was actually originating from a different location. So really trying to understand where you should start looking for that, those connection pieces, because it might not just be beside where you're looking or where it is now. It could be in a total other location on the, on the planet. So, you know, uh, the east coast of Canada, for example, used to be part of Europe. So, I mean, that would be an example. It's not, uh, wasn't originally in that orientation uh, when it was uh, deposited and then and lithified. So, yeah, those are interesting things. And also, um, I think when you look at how we are using this information, the historical records, and how we're how things are moving into yeah, today and into the future, I think it's going to be really interesting because how I see the world's evo evolution and process is really trying to create this sort of equilibrium of the planet. You know, the planet is always trying to get in balance. And so over time, you know, when the carbon uh, was really high in the atmosphere, it's then been, uh, you know, sequestered and uh, buried. And now we have been able to through oil and gas, you know, we've extracted that again, and now we're seeing it, it uh, peak again. So, I mean, I think this period is the first time in the history of the planet where there's been a high carbon in the atmosphere buried and then uh, reintroduced, I yeah. mean, um, at this yeah. level. So it is interesting to see what happened in the past to trigger these big events and what we could be then leading into as we are, yeah creating these environments again, or maybe it's a total other uh, direction it will go into. Thinking about um, use of sedimentary rocks or, um, for, well, um, oil and gas and stuff. But even now today, they're really finding that uh, there's a lot of geothermal um, potential in, I think it's the fold and thrust belts along the Rocky Mountains. So going from Canada, uh, down into uh, the states as well and yep. they're seeing that the, there is currently uh, a project um, Kathy Hickson is working on on the Alberta number one project and they have re drilled down and reached uh, yeah uh, good temperatures for geothermal production so uh, I think this is also a lot of potential for even oil and gas companies to explore and oh, diversify yeah. into uh, greener energy solutions so that was a great interview. Thanks so much for watching till the end. We really hope you liked it. And we also want to thank our expert, Mr. John Clay, for uh, his time and effort in uh, sharing with us the video of sedimentology. Please uh, feel free to visit the website of Earth Science Matters for more publication on this theme. And we hope to see you in future publications. Bye-bye.